Hi, kids on ice. Mr. Ty here, welcoming you to our ninth episode of Fort DuPont Ice Arena's At Home Program. I hope you've enjoyed the previous program, and I hope everybody is staying healthy and active uh, during these times. Today's episode, we're going to be talking a little bit about how we make ice and how we make it smooth. So I put a little bit of a presentation together here for us to follow along. So what do we know about ice? Well, when we ask people about ice, most people can tell us two things. The first thing is, is that you need water. That seems to be a very common key ingredient and it's a good answer. The second thing that we do is we take water and they will say we freeze it. We bring it down to a temperature below 32 degrees. Now, the whole freezing thing becomes a little bit of a challenge because there's no way of really making things cold. There's only the absence of heat. So instead of making things cold, we do things to remove the heat so that the water then be goes from a liquid to a solid. So if water and temperature below 32 degrees was all we need, it would be really, really easy for ice rinks. But ice rinks do a lot of different things to focus on the water and the temperature. So first, when we look at the water for ice rinks, uh, we wanna make sure that the water is clean, that there's very little mineral content. So if you have hard water at home, your ice quality isn't going to be all that great in an ice rink if uh, the, the water source has a very, very high mineral content. The second thing, which surprises a lot of people, is when we talk about making ice, we focus on using hot water and we use the hot water to build the ice in very, very, very small layers. So I'm sure most of you are wondering, why do we use hot water? Well, there are three main reasons why we use hot water when making ice in an ice rink. The first comes is, is it freezes faster. Believe it or not, hot water will freeze faster than cold water. And the reason for that is, is like anything, when we heat things, things expand. Metal expands. Uh, as things get hot, they get uh, wider or taller. I'm sure by the end of the summer, if you measure yourself in the heat of the summer, you might get a little taller too. But what happens with water is the molecules kind of spread out as everything expands with heat. And um, it allows the individual molecules then to have the heat removed quicker from it and cause freezing to happen a lot faster. So not only does it freeze faster, but it creates a good bond. So what happens is we have a water surface or, or ice out there. And as we go out with uh, the ice resurfacer or we use our, our wand or our nozzles to make ice, we're gonna put a very small layer of hot water. And that causes that ice to bond really well, to stick so well that it becomes an incredibly hard surface. And when we talk about hard surfaces and creating a good bond, we ask people all the time, what is the hardest substance on earth to cut? And most people are able to answer, it's a diamond. Okay, that is the hardest surface to uh, the cut, the hardest substance to cut. But what they don't know is the second hardest surface to cut is artificial ice. Uh, and that's because the bond is created so well with the, the hot water that we use that it makes it very, very, very tough uh, to actually get through. So we're gonna talk a bit a little bit about the blade we use to shave the ice here in a little bit. So between the freezing faster and creates a good bond, it also has less air in it. And that's really what is actually the cause of number two, which is creating a good bond. So if we use hot water and we slowly build it, the ice becomes not only very good bond, but it's very clear. And if we use cold water, the ice becomes very cloudy because there's a bunch of air trapped in it. And here's a good picture. On the picture on the left, you can see here that we used hot water at a very, very fine mist to slowly build that ice cube. And then we took cold water, very, very cold water, 40 degrees, 
and we put it in a tray and we put it in there and this is what ended up coming out and you can see it's very clouded which wouldn't be good for the lines when we play hockey but it also makes it very very brittle and that ice breaks up really really easy so besides using hot water here we get a question a lot of times how thick is our ice surface well fortunately for us we are not playing uh, or skating outdoors because when it comes to outdoor ice rinks well we do have to worry about actually falling through the ice if the ice isn't at least four inches thick so somewhere about four inches it's usually pretty safe to go out on the ice but we're not worried about that here we're skating indoors so here at the Fort DuPont Ice Arena we keep our ice about an inch to an inch and a half thick that's it so how much water does it take to get an inch of ice? Well, that's a good question. When we talk about adding water, we're gonna do it in gallons. And I'm sure most of you have a big gallon jug uh, in the refrigerator or have had a big gallon of jug in the house at some point there. And that's, that's a gallon. The really big ones there are a gallon. So if you emptied that out with milk and you cleaned it out and you put it in water, well, that wouldn't quite get us the ice rink, but that would be a start. We would need not only the one gallon that you created, but we would need you and uh, quite a few of your other friends to get us to 10,000 gallons of fresh water, good hot water, just over about, uh, I think it's 10,600 gallons of water to create a good sheet of ice, one inch thick for uh, us to skate on in the uh, artificial indoor ice rink. So 10,000 gallons, that's a lot of water to get us to an inch. So here's our sheet of ice. Here's our ice without ice, I guess I should say. This is our rink floor here. Uh, right before we start the season, what we're gonna do is we're gonna come in, we're gonna clean that floor really, really well. And after we clean that floor, we're just gonna put a little bit of water down and we're gonna drop the temperature. We're gonna drop the temperature well below 32 degrees. We're gonna actually get it in the teens because we're gonna to have to build ice slowly and it's gonna require a lot of work from our compressors. So we're gonna lower the ice temperature. We're gonna get it below freezing. We're gonna put a very, very small layer of ice all over uh, the floor, covering the floor with about a 30 second of an inch of ice. And then we're gonna go out and we're gonna paint the ice. This is where we put the circles, the arrows, the hash marks, the logo, the face off dots, the gold creases, the speed skating dots, everything goes down onto the ice. Just a very, very, very fine amount of ice. We paint the ice, not the floor. And then we come back with that over 10,000 gallons and we slowly, build that ice. We want it to almost flash freeze. We don't want the water as we put it on, as we're building it, we don't want the water to puddle there because if it puddles there, what will end up happening is the water will eventually become cold before it freezes. And that, that kind of defeats our purpose. We want the hot water. We don't want it to be cloudy. So that's what we're going to do. And once we do that and we get to that stage, we have a fresh sheet of ice, uh, which nobody's used. The staff gets very excited because we know our kids on ice uh, programs are going to be starting soon. Usually our summer camps are the first thing out of the gate for us. And of course, fresh ice attracts our skaters. And the reason, as most of you have probably figured out, that you're referred to as skaters is because of those things at the bottom of your feet. We all know that ice, especially wet ice, is very, very slippery. So at the bottom of your skates, we have the blades and at the bottom of the blades, the things that make contact with the ice are actually two very, very, very razor sharp uh, edges. And they dig into the ice. And because those little blades, those small blades edges are digging in the ice, that allows you to stand. So if we want to skate, we have to dig those blades into the ice, which actually causes small fractures into the ice and we actually break the ice up as we skate. So here's an example. When we took our group down to Ushuaia, Argentina, we were out on the ice, we were out on fresh ice, and we took a little bit of video and you can see all these little fractures in the ice, and it looks like snow on the ice. 
And it's really not snow. It's just this very, very fine ice that's broken as our blades dig into the ice to propel us forwards or backwards or whatever direction we want to go there. So as this happens, this has been a problem. This has been, I don't want to say a problem. This has been the reality of ice since we've started ice skating, whether it's been in the canals and uh, uh, northern Europe or uh, on the lakes and ponds as a mean of transportation, that's how skating started, is we've made an impact on that ice. And we go back in time, we can look at pictures. Here's a picture. If we look at a very, very old picture, we know it's an old picture. First, because we can see the hockey players aren't wearing helmets, the goalies not wearing helmets. Maybe our hockey people are looking and seeing the straight sticks. They say, ah, that's, that's a very old picture there. But look at the snow that's created over the time from them skating. And part of the problem is, is there's a lot of snow for two reasons. One is a lot of times they didn't use hot water. So the water was cold, which created the snow because of the air in it, as we mentioned earlier. But back in the day, before we had ice resurfacers, they only cleaned the ice once a day. And that was typically at the end of the night or the start of the morning. So this ice is skated on all day, creating snow and more snow. And uh, this is a great picture, an example of it. If we look at our speed skating, we can tell it's an old picture here. Look, you can tell by the clothes, the kids aren't wearing helmets. And back then they actually pulled a string. You can see a fine string coming around here. And the first one to break the string as they skated through was actually gonna be the winner there. And even with the figure skaters, look at the high boots come all the way up, the very, very old skates you can see here. You, some people wonder why we call the surface, the, the structure around the rink boards. You can actually see the wood slats that are put together here uh, on the boards. But look at all the snow. So snow or the very, very small ice fragments uh, has been in existence for a very, very long time. So somebody came up with an idea I want fresh ice. I want it more often than just once a day. And that person, oops, sorry, before we get to him. So when we clean the ice, we're looking at, it used to take about five to six people, 60 to 90 minutes to clear the ice. Think about that. It's over an hour to hour and a half. They would enter the ice surface. They would have shovels or as the old, uh, folk singer Arlo Guthrie would say shovels and rakes and implements of destruction and they'd push the snow and they'd create piles and they'd have carts or wheelbarrows and they'd shovel it or they'd push it outdoors if doors were close enough and then they'd have to go out and actually spend the time flooding it. Again I mentioned we were in Argentina we had taken our figure skaters and speed skaters there in Argentina here we are we happen to be in at the outdoor rink there so the snow was actually coming from the sky it was a lot of fun but our skaters got to see firsthand how they have to deal with it because that's way too much snow for an ice resurfacer to be able to uh, clean here. So they got a little creative when they get more snow here. You can see the hockey group. There's too much snow for ice. So they're playing with a soccer ball until they can get a little patch of ice here cleaned out. And you can see the coaches and siblings here helping out. And you can really see the energy and work it takes just for two of them to push that little bit of snow uh, just out of one zone right out to the blue line. Uh, to create the path there and uh, it's, it's absolutely amazing to see people work so hard to make sure that kids are out on the ice participating and having fun. So now enters the picture in the 1940s a gentleman by the name of Frank Zamboni. Him and his family started an ice rink after selling block ice for a lot of years as the business was slowly starting to go down as more and more places in the 30s started getting electricity in the homes and the farms, the block ice sales went down. So enters Frank, they take the, infer they take the ice making equipment and instead of making block ice, they throw it in the ground and they create what is the Iceland ice rink. Now this is in Paramount, California. The ice rink is still there, it is covered. It's got a roof on it now. But this is in the 1940s. Very, very few ice rinks existed outside of what they call traditional ice rink areas, which would be New England, Massachusetts, Vermont, 
New Hampshire, upstate New York, uh, Pennsylvania, and then the upper Midwest with uh, Michigan, Wisconsin, Minnesota, North Dakota. They had ice rinks, but in places that weren't didn't have traditional uh, big snowfalls, cold weather, ice was, wasn't that common. Here in Washington, D.C., for instance, in the 1940s, I believe the only rink that existed might have been Uline Arena in the greater Washington, D.C. area. And I think it was probably in the 1950s that there was one uh, kind of up in the Gaithersburg, Chevy Chase area. But it took a long time for ice to kind of, an ice rinks to populate in the southern and warmer climates. So here, Frank Zamboni and his family, they create this Iceland ice rink. You can see it's very, very popular. The Los Angeles uh, families and communities enjoyed skating. They created a lot of snow. He saw the snow. He wanted to make a better experience for his skaters. He wanted to maintain a good flat sheet of ice. So he tinkered around and he went down and to parts stores and he bought old World War II surplus equipment. And after about seven and eight years of tinkering, this is what he came up with. The first self-propelled ice resurfacer. And it's a very, very unique piece of equipment. Uh, it was one, he built one. He had one ice rink, that's all he built. So he built it for his ice rink and it worked beautifully. And because of him, he took what used to be five people, over five people, 60 to 90 minutes. Now that job went from a lot of man hours and a lot of time down to one person being able to do it in 10 to 15 minutes. So reducing the cost, reducing the time, reducing the man hours and actually producing a good sheet of ice. And how he did that was not only removing the snow, but he put four principles into what he was trying to accomplish. First thing is, is the machine uh, actually shaves the ice. It cuts a 32nd of an inch of ice when it goes out on the ice. So how much is a 32nd of an inch? Well, if you put your fingers and thumb together and you pull it apart, just when you start to see daylight, that's about a 32nd of an inch, okay? So the machine goes out and it shaves down into the ice to cut out some of those ruts. And as it scrapes the ice, it's gonna create snow, just like your blades create snow. So as it creates the snow and along with the snow that it creates and you create, well, what it does is it removes that snow from the surface. And it uses augers and a conveyor system to replace it. And I'll show you how they do that here in a second. So it shaves ice, it collects the snow. The next thing it does is it cleans the ice. And we're not talking about going out with mops and cleaning the ice that way. What it's trying to do is it's trying to clean out the ruts that are created by your skating. And sometimes dirt and debris and snow gets in there. And we don't want snow in a rut and then to freeze water on top of it because as soon as a blade touches it, it's gonna put that hole back in. So it flushes out the ruts and that water then mixes with some of the snow it creates. And instead of having snow in there, fresh snow, it puts slush in there. And then after it puts the slush into those ruts to make it a good hard uh, area on the ice, then it comes through and it uses hot water to replace the 32nd of an inch that it removed. And that hot water actually seals in that slush. So that way it doesn't pop open as easy as it would if it was just snow or if we removed the snow and didn't push slush in there, then it'd be just a big bump. So the shaving the ice, the collecting the snow, the cleaning of the ice, and the laying the hot water to replace it, these are all four principles that he had on his very first ice resurfacer back in 1949, the very, very first one he created. This was the four, these were the four things that accomplished. And today, those exact principles are applied to every ice resurfacer that is used today. Zamboni still uses those four principles. 
a lot of competitors are out there now, whether it be Olympia, which we have at our rink, a Yuko, an Ingo, whatever it may be, every time those ice resurfaces hit the ice, they are doing the exact same thing that uh, Mr. Zamboni started in 1949. So if we look at a little bit of a modern machine here, hopefully you can follow my cursor here, uh, right up front, in front of the front wheels, we have the engine, okay? Most of them use a car engine or a small truck engine to pull them around. Some of them are battery powered now, but up here is our power source, okay? At the very top half of the machine in the front, that is our snow dump, or what's referred to as snow collection. So we're gonna collect, we're gonna cut, and we're gonna collect snow, and all the snow gets put right in the front of the machine here, and you can see the picture kind of illustrating that. And then in the back half, under the back bottom half, that's where we store our hot water. Now, there's gonna be about 120 to 140 gallon tank there that we can fill with hot water. But when we go out on the ice, when we cut the ice, we're looking to cut about 100 uh, cubic feet of snow, that 30 second of an inch of ice. To replace that in one ice resurfacing, it's going to take 90 gallons of water. Now, remember we talked about the milk, uh, big milk jug being a gallon. It's going to take about 90 of those to make a good sheet of ice for us. Uh, every time we go out. And we're looking for that water temperature to be about 140 to 160 degrees. That's hot. Again, we want hot water to create that good bond. So this part here, this is kind of where the magic is, where I talk about this is really specific to making good ice. And to make good ice, if we zoom in on this, this is called the conditioner. So there's a couple of things we need. One is we need good downward pressure. We're going to need to put that down on the ice and put it down very, very hard so that our blade, which is the silver thing right under the corkscrew here, our blade is able to dig in. And remember, we said we're not cutting through butter here, folks. We're cutting through very, very hard substance, second hardest substance out there or surface out there to cut. So. This blade here is very, very, very sharp. It runs the length of the conditioner. It's shaving snow. It's creating snow, it's collecting snow. So some of that snow, most of that snow is gonna be picked up by our augers, which is gonna pull it into the middle. It's gonna pull it into the middle, shoot it into what we call the vertical auger, which is gonna come up and then shoot it into our dump tank. Now, some of that snow is gonna stay behind in this green pipe you see here. This is the wash water we talked about. So this wash water is going to come out. It's going to shoot water and clean out all those ruts. And then it's going to mix with some snow and create some slush that's going to be pushed down in all of the ruts that we have out on the ice there. And then finally, this big bar here at the end, this is our flood water. This is our hot water. This is the water that's replacing the ice that we shaved to keep our ice between an inch and an inch and a half. And it also seals in the slush so that it gets a good bond as it freezes. Here's a little illustration of it at work here. As you can see, as it spins around, you can see our augers are collecting the snow that the blade is shaving here. And again, our green pipe here, this will be uh, flushing out those ruts, mixing with the snow. And then this gray pipe at the very end, that's our flood water, that's the hot water. And in some rinks where it's very, very cold in the rink, you can actually see when the icy surface gets out on the ice, you can actually see steam coming up from behind as that hot water is being laid onto the ice. So again, those same exact same principles apply today. Very, very little has changed. There's been some technology to make it easier, but that's what every ice resurfacer out there is trying to do and create. So here's this machine. As I said, he only had one, he only needed one. It was maybe looks a little crude to you. Uh, very, very simple. It wasn't a big deal until, and remember, he's in Los Angeles, enters the picture of a young lady named Sonia Henney. 
Sonia Henny is a Norwegian figure skater. She won the 1928 Olympics, the 1932 Olympics, and the 1936 Olympics. She won 10 world championships as, uh, championships as a figure skater. So after her figure skating career, she moves to Los Angeles, becomes a movie star. One of the biggest movie stars at her peak. She was the highest paid movie star in Hollywood in the late 30s and early 40s. Ah, early 40s. Not only did he, she uh, have the acting career, but she had an Ice Follies program. This is where she had what we would call maybe today, maybe ice shows or ice capades back in the 70s and 80s. This is where she traveled around the United States and the world putting on ice shows all over the place in front of people. So she did that for a long time. Now, while she's in LA as an actress, she happened upon um, Mr. Zamboni's rink in Paramount, California. And she saw that machine and she said, that machine is fabulous, it makes great ice. I don't want you to make me one. She says, I want two, I need two. She bought the first two ice resurfacers. And again, he wasn't planning on getting into making them. He was just trying to make his ice at his rink better. So she, he went down, he went down to the old World War II surplus place. As you can see, the old World War II Jeep here, about a bunch of supplies, and he made her two machines. And as she traveled the United States and went into all these different areas, people started seeing this ice resurfacer. And they started calling him saying, hey, I need one of those. Hey, we want one of those. And the next thing you know, everybody's reaching out to him. And back in the day, again, he didn't have a factory. He wasn't expecting to expand this quickly. So he would go buy a Jeep. And then you can see the snow dump tank up here. He would put wheels on it. And he would put all these conveyors and belts and levers and hoses and everything into that snow dump tank that was hooked to the back and he would pull that trailer and if it was Denver, Colorado, he would load everything up, he would drive to Denver, Colorado and he would assemble it on site or maybe it was Chicago. And it went on and on and on. And the next thing you know, instead of just having an ice rink, which the family still owns today, they now have a factory that produces a couple of hundred machines every year and the, it's still family owned. And because he, uh, Sonia Henney took this all over the United States and then ended up in the world, we've gotten ice resurfacers in every ice arena uh, around the country and world. And this has also produced some pretty unique things. One thing it produced is probably the most popular Zamboni driver any of us know. Even Snoopy enjoys getting on the machine and making fresh ice. Look at him, wave, smile. And here you're gonna hear uh, Charlie Brown. It's gonna be hard to say, but Charlie Brown says there are three things that everybody will stare at. A flowing uh, creek, the crackling of a fireplace, and a Zamboni going around in a circle. So with that famous uh, Zamboni driver, some things that you may not know. One thing you may not know is here at the Fort DuPont Ice Arena, every single day, our staff spends two to three hours working on that ice, trying to make it great, trying to make it flat, trying to make it beautiful so that our participants, our kids on the ice are able to go out on the ice, enjoy the ice, and help you be successful. So the next time you are in our ice rink and you see this machine on the ice, give it a wave. Or if you see these six gentlemen walking around the ice rink, take a second, oh, take a second and say, hey, thanks for the great ice. Maybe give them a fist bump, a high five, a thumbs up, whatever it may be. These guys spend hours every day making that ice for you. They spend hours every year in training every single year to make sure they are operating that machine uh, not only correctly, but safely. They also have certificates from the U.S. Ice Rink Association where they have taken classes in order to put a better sheet of ice out there for you. 
So with that, be sure to thank them. And to all of you, thank you for paying attention. Hopefully you get a little bit of better understanding about what that machine does and a little bit of the history of it. Please stay healthy, stay active, and the staff and I cannot wait to see you back here at Fort DuPont Ice Arena. Thank you.